If you're going to get into the adventure world, you better feel dialed in what you're doing, you know, and the last thing you want is for a production company to hire someone who's going to be a liability. There's a lot of competition in the sense that a lot of people like the idea of the work and not that many people who are actually willing to put in the work, and those are always the people who rise to the top. And that's that's actually very, very fair. I think people romanticize the idea of being like an adventure filmmaker, but like, how willing are you to get out of your tent when it's howling and negative 40? Yeah, it could be brutal. If someone wanted to try and follow in your footsteps, right? What would you sort of suggest these days? Oh boy, that's a good question. Documentary filmmaking and adventure tend to go hand in hand, and getting out into some of the world's most extreme and remote places is honestly one of the biggest perks of the job, at least for me anyways. But of all the DPs I've met in my career, one guy in particular stands out way above the rest. It's no exaggeration to say that Pablo Durana is one of the world's very best adventure cinematographers, and the fact that he's also a close personal friend and the person who helped me break into the industry myself many years ago is just kind of icing on the cake. And don't just take my word for it because some of the biggest names in the business are also saying exactly the same thing. And luckily for us all, I was able to get Pablo to sit down with us between shoots to talk about everything from how he broke into the competitive industry, how he found his filmmaking niche, and how you can too, the importance of networking, and how you can stand out in a very crowded market. I've honestly never met anyone who's even close to Pablo's level when it comes to getting cameras into really extreme places, and the fact that he also shoots so much more than just adventure stuff makes him even more impressive. So enjoy this rare chance to pick the brain of one of the best in the business because Pablo doesn't do a ton of interviews and the advice he shares here is pure gold. Okay, so welcome to another industry pro conversation. We're super lucky today because we actually have the guy who brought me into the world of production um, quite a few years ago now, Pablo Durana. If you're into outdoor adventure kind of stuff, you might've already heard of him, but legitimately one of the hardest, if not the hardest working DP I've ever met. Like Stop I've- Stop it. Know, I, <laughs> I'd like to think that I have done a bunch of rugged stuff, but I've watched Pablo do things like hang off rock walls and climb down the deepest caves and lead Antarctic, ex just next level stuff. I'm not joking when I say he's like literally one of the best adventure camera operators slash cinematographers in the world. Um, I'm not gonna embarrass him. <laughs> and he's married, so I'm, uh, I'm not gonna embarrass I'm him with too many accomplishments, but he's done pretty much all of it and worked with lots of big people like Nat Geo and Netflix and Jimmy Chin and all these names. So Pablo, thank you for coming and it's great to see you. It's good to be here, Luquito. So before we start talking about uh, DP stuff, you got into this world in sort of an unusual way, like you came in. Well, I don't know if it's unusual. I, I don't think there's a standard way of getting in or maybe there is, I just don't know of it, but I always loved photography. Like it was always fun. Like I was editor for the school yearbook and you know, it was like a hobby, you know, I learn how to develop my own black and white and uh but I ne it never occurred to me that you know i could get into this as a profession and then when i was in school and in college in north carolina i got a, a scholarship and i took a semester off and biked across china with my sister at that time you know you had to give a presentation and i hated public speaking so i was like can i just do a little video of you know the trip or whatever and so i took this little camera i had no idea what i was doing but i just fell in love with the idea of storytelling and travel, I was, you know, determined to try to see if I could make that into a career. Um, I was lucky enough to get an internship with National Geographic, which is kind of what got my foot in the door. Met a lot of really amazing people. From there, I, yeah, moved to DC. I, I got offered a job as an associate producer, and I worked in the office for about six months. But I knew I wanted to be. Um, you know, filmmaker, camera person. And so I quit and spent my money, life savings on a camera and kind of went on from there, just taking jobs as, as PA, AC. I was fortunate enough, you know, during my internship, I met this husband and wife couple, uh, Sean Fine and Andrea Nix Fine. And to this day, I think are still some of the best documentary storytellers out there. And I was determined to, to work with them. Sean, who, at the time was you know, working on a few documentaries, he, he would always just go as, you know, DP and sound person. So really the only way I could work with him was to be a sound person. So I actually taught myself audio and convinced him 
to to let me work with him. And it not only gave me, you know, the confidence to work by myself, because when I'm on expeditions, I don't necessarily have the, the luxury of a sound operator, but it was also kind of just like my masterclass. As an audio operator, I got to work with all these great DPs and it was a really good learning experience. You know, I wasn't impatient of like, oh, I just want to be a DP. You know, I knew that was kind of what I wanted as an end result, but enjoying the process, I think is really important. I mean, it is, I think that's a great thing to hear because it is such a long process. Anyone who thinks they're going to shortcut it and do it really quickly is sort of setting them up for setting themselves up for disappointment. So after that, you finished school, you finished the internship and you, you, you busted your ass in that program. And then what was the transition like from there into starting to become like an air quotes pro? Like how did you start getting paid? How did your career build off that? I mean, a lot of it was through, you know, the, the connections that I had built in National Geographic. And I, I soon realized that it's, it's important to nerd, cultivate relationships and, you know, leave jobs in good standing. Um, you know, you do one job and someone will recommend you to something else. And I think it was important to also find ways to make yourself, you know, stand out from other people. You know, like I, I speak three languages, so that was a huge benefit. You know, I got jobs in, you know, in Africa and South America. Um, so I spoke Spanish and French. Um, you know, I was a climber, you know, and that got me into this, you know, this project that then led to, you know, all this adventure. You could be super capable as an athlete, but are you a good storyteller? And I think focusing on other stories where, you know, you don't rely on action and excitement to keep an audience entertained, where you're relying on storytelling to keep them entertained. I think that's, that's critical to then, you know, take that and, and push it into the adventure world and, you know, and ask yourself, well, how can I tell a good story beyond just shooting pretty images? I think that's super important because the pretty images are getting so easy, you know, yeah. with the gear is getting so good that slow, beautiful slow-mo doesn't mean much anymore, right? There's got to be that story with it. At its core, there's no luck in getting to where you are now. Like there were some lucky encounters, but like, I mean, I've seen lots of people and I've talked a lot, like I know lots of people in this community and everyone has something similar where luck comes to the people who are in a position to take advantage of it, right? Like you worked so hard and I think that's maybe one of the big takeaways from your career and, and, and mine for people trying to emulate it is that there is no, you don't, there's no like rule book. You can't say do this and then this and then this and it will work. But if you make your own stuff, open yourself up to meeting as many people as you can and work really hard for a long period of time, you've got a pretty good, you've got a, as good of a shot as you can, as you can make for yourself. And I mean, if you're gonna get into the adventure world, like you better feel dialed in what you're doing, you know? And the last thing you want is for a production company to hire someone who's gonna be a liability or, you know, for the talent to be waiting on you. Um, I mean, if you really wanna get into the adventure world, like, you, you know, you also have to train. You have to get your body in a in a physical condition where where you can keep up or be faster than the people that you're working with. And it's just attitude. I mean, I don't think anyone wants to hire an asshole. Um, so just be a, be nice. Yeah. Don't. Uh, if, yeah. There's no room for like toxic energy anywhere there, and it's one of the most important things I think that people. You know, you can be a workaholic, but if people don't want to be around you, you're not gonna you're not going to get called back. How do you see the general shape of the market then these days in general? Like, do you, do you think there's more opportunities for young people to get into this stuff? Is it getting more competitive? What have you sort of Well, it's, it's definitely competitive. I mean, it's, it's way easier to, to be a filmmaker. I mean, you can make a film with your iPhone. Um, but I also think there's a lot more opportunity. Like there's a lot more, like, there's a lot more content being produced. Um, there's a lot more opportunity for viewing, like all these streaming services, all these different platforms. Um, I mean, it's sometimes overwhelming how many different platforms there are, but there's a lot of content being, being shot. There's a lot of uh, companies now that are leaning on, you know, branded content, you know, doing, you know, documentaries. Um, so I think there's definitely way more opportunity, but 
there's also I, I also feel like there's probably a lot more competition too yeah i think that's accurate i think a lot of people i think that i think the one thing i've noticed though is that there's a lot of competition in the sense that a lot of people like the idea of the work and not that many people who are actually willing to put in the work and those are always the people who rise to the top and that's that's actually very very fair i think people romanticize the idea of being like an adventure filmmaker but like how willing are you to you know get out of your tent when it's howling and negative 40 and you know get out to maybe just get one shot but that's you know an important shot to get and um yeah it could be brutal <laughs> if you if everything went away overnight for some reason and suddenly you're pablo fresh out of film school knowing what you know now but none of the contacts and none of the resume what would be your sort of playbook what would you do to start working your way back up to where you are i mean find find a way to make yourself stand out you know experiment i'd maybe go to my local you know whichever local business you know do maybe do a little a little promo piece for them you know and, and actually start filming start getting something some content out there um I'd probably reach out to people and not just reach out to people, but actually, you know, if there's a particular person that I gravitate towards in terms of the type of work they do or the style of filming that they do and I want to learn more from them, like take the time to actually watch their films, take the time to analyze. And like when you write someone, not just write to them saying, oh, hey, I want to be a filmmaker, you know, can I be your assistant, you know, show them that you've put in the time and that you actually have a genuine interest. You know, why is it that you want to work with this person? You know, watch their films and, and you know, figure out how to stand out, I guess. That's one of the first things. I mean, it's, inv I mean, it's so true though. Like the, the, I get a lot of emails and I'm guessing you do too, that people say, I want to do this and I want you to help me but I haven't done anything. You know, I haven't actually started the process myself. Compare that to someone who comes in and says, here are four projects that I shot on my own in my mm -hmm. community that are in the style that I want to be working in. And I've watched your last three projects. And based on that, I, I rage about networking all the time, but what you're saying is so true. Like there's a difference between just DMing someone and saying, help me out mm -hmm. and actually taking the time to show them that you want to learn from them. I mean, like your origin story, right? Sean, you were like, I want to work with you. I don't need anybody unless you'll do sound. Yeah. Like, okay, well, I will learn sound then. Mm -hmm. let's, let's, let's switch topics here for a sec because neither of us are overly technical DPs. Um, but what are you shooting with these days? We both like toys but we're not super technical, but we both they're, like little... They're not toys, Luke. <laughs> they're instruments. <laughs> surgical, surgical instruments. They're surgical, expensive instruments. <laughs> so what are you, what are you, what's your sort of main, your standard setup look like these days? What are you using? Uh, I just upgraded to the Burano and, uh, and I have the FX6. So I usually like to have two bodies. Um, you know, most of the time you have some, you know, two camera interviews or, you know, I'll have the FX6 set up either on a gimbal or, you know, really, really small handheld that I can just pick up and run. Um, and then the Burano would be more for kind of like verite shoulder work. Um, I've got my drones, even smaller. I've got the, the R5 Canon, um, which is great in situations where maybe you need to do stills and video at the same time. Um, but I mean, that's kind of my video setup, you know, I have a GoPro, but I try not to use it, um, but there's <laughs> have, a time and a place for it. So your, your setups can vary a lot depending on the environment and how much weight you're allowed to bring and stuff. But like, what about lenses and lights and stuff like that? How much stuff comes out with you on a normal loadout? Let's say not an extreme expedition, but what are you, what are you generally trying to get out with? You've got two cameras. And what about all the other stuff? 
what are you, how are you setting them up? Um, I mean, I guess it just depends on the project, depends on the style. I mean, I could go on a project and just shoot on prime lenses. Um, or what do you have for what do you use for that? You've got you've got those Leicas, right? Yeah, I've got these old rehoused uh, Leica R's. I think they're old from the '80s. Um, you know, they're really nice with sun flare. They're definitely a look, uh, but I really like them. And I just like that they're small. Like I, I could fit all six in my backpack, and you know, which is important for me. Um, you know, so you know, if I bring. I probably always have like one or two primes, no matter what, um, either for interviews or, you know, for low light scenarios. Um, so like a 35 and an 80 is always a nice prime to have if you're just gonna have one or two. Um, and then it just depends on the production. You know, you have just the regular Canon 24 to 105. I mean, if I were just to have one lens, I mean, that's a just a great workhorse. Uh, but if you're at a higher end type of documentary, I've got the Fujinon Cabrio, the 19 to 90, which I think is a great Verite uh, lens. Um, it's a little heavier, but um, but it's you know you could you could shoot on that lens all day. Do you find yourself mostly going to zooms then, and then primes are for more specific cases? Like are zooms mostly on your camera? I know. I mean, if you're shooting, if you're by yourself, yes. You know, if it's a two camera shoot, you can get away with, you know, shooting on primes, um, if that's the look that you want. Um, it just depends on, yeah, it just depends on who you're, what the subject is, you know, what the directorial style. Um, and I, I totally agree, but what, why, why, why do you say zooms when you're by yourself? We do the same thing. I'm just, yeah. why, why? I guess it just depends. Like if, if, if you're in a space and you have a limited amount of time and you're trying to cover something like, so what I enjoy shooting most is, is verite, but I feel like that word gets thrown out a lot. But in the true sense of verite, it's, it's basically filming something that's happening that will not repeat itself. Um, and your job is to capture it, but you know, capture it beautifully. Yeah, amazing. Uh, what's up next for Pablo? What do, you, what do you have going on? What's coming up? What's in your future? Oh, it's what are a your secret. hopes and dreams? It's a secret, Luke. <laughs> you got, uh, you've got your movie in film festivals, right? Yeah, I've got my film. Um, we're kind of nearing the, the year long film festival uh, circuit and hopefully get that get it distributed and out to the world. Um, working on a few other you know documentaries with, with a few different uh, directors. Um, but yeah, also quality of life, you know, doing some home projects, still finding that balance. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but yeah cool man where 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 do you where can people find you you're mostly on instagram right if if there's yeah. any social media presence yeah i'd say instagram is probably the you famously the had like the most basic website ever for the longest time i think do you I still, still have, have the same the I same website I, I think i still have the same web i i actually just added a few things last night because you reminded me and i was like huh i haven't updated it in like a year. I feel like recommendations hold a lot of weight, you know, in the community. I mean, for me, like if I get offered a job that I can't do, I will always recommend a colleague of mine, you know, and it'll go both ways. You know, if they can't do something, you know, they'll, they'll recommend me, you know, I think recommend, yeah. But getting to that point where you could recommend people, that's, that's the tough part. Yeah, that's the tough part. Yeah, yeah it's true. Working hard for someone else and having them suggest you is how most jobs go mm -hmm. in you know people are not so much stumbling upon uh you know they're not googling for their next dp they're like does this person i trust can they do it if no who do they who do they think's up to it so it's sort of your reputation is everything cool pablo well it's lovely to connect with you it's always good to talk uh we probably don't do it enough because we're both super busy but um yeah i appreciate you taking the time to to share all that with everybody i think it's going to be super helpful Thanks, Luke, and 
it's 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 been exciting and fun seeing your growth and everything that you're doing and yeah i'm psyched that you're doing this channel i think it's really helpful um i mean it's definitely a tool that i i wish i had uh when i was getting started so so good for you yeah me too that's why that's where the idea came from it's like what do i wish i had i wanted to hear people tell me what to do mm -hmm. anyways uh great to talk and thanks for everything pablo we'll see you soon bye luke bye bye so I hope you found that as interesting as I did because there really aren't that many DPs out there who even come close to what Pablo does. And that was just a short excerpt from a much larger conversation, which is gonna be available exclusively to members of my documentary cinematography program very soon. The course has really limited spaces and it's currently full, but if you wanna be the first to know when it opens back up and get a discount for being early, use the link in the description to get on the waitlist and get access to a bunch more professional conversations like these. See ya.